you here. Thank you for joining us for the last talk of the semester in the Historic Preservation Lecture Series. We're very fortunate today to have uh, Sarah Healy Dilks join us from London. She is a senior sculpture conservator at the Victoria and Albert Museum and also uh, a conservator in private practice based in Cambridge in the UK. Since graduating in conservation studies from the City and Guild of London Art School in 1990, she has worked for over 30 years on contemporary and historic art collections with materials ranging from stone, concrete, plaster, terracotta, 3D prints and mixed media installations. She uh, is currently working on the VNA's large scale refurbishment of projects and new displays at le as lead conservator for the cast of Trajan's Column. And I first met Sarah inside of Trajan's Column when I had the good fortune of doing a contemporary art installation that involved cleaning the interior. And she um, was one of the people who had to approve my, uh, my installation <laughs> and my cleaning, but um, who also, and I have to say this really speaks volumes about Sarah, joined me on the scaffold to actually do the cleaning. Uh, and, and I recall with, with uh, real you know, excitement, all the conversations that we had on the scaffold about Trajan's column. Um, the project that we did together, and I can really say we, because it was a collaborative effort, uh, resulted in, in a monumental latex cast of the interior of, of Trajan's column. And it happened right at the middle between two large conservation projects that the VNA was working on. There are two cast courts, and Sarah had been working on one for about four years, and then they were transitioning on to the one that Trajan's column is in, that it has more architectural pieces. And so this project was really kind of at the beginning. And since, for the last four years, Sarah and her team have been working on the, on the cast courts uh, where Trajan's column is. So it's just so exciting to have this return flight, uh, virtual return flight, and to have you now uh, virtually at Columbia University to tell us about this, these, these four years, uh, these intervening four years, um, and about your work and methods in general. It's a real privilege and an honor to have you here at Columbia University, again, virtually. Um, and uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please, Sarah, I, I, uh, I, I, I welcome you with, with, uh, with great enthusiasm and I am the official clapper uh, to hand off the podium since everyone <laughs> on, uh, is, is um, uh, silenced by Zoom, unfortunately, but uh, I know that everybody is joining me and welcoming you uh, with great enthusiasm. So uh, over to you, Sarah. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to move that out of the way. Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jorge, for that. I might quickly, before I forget, just uh, just for the fact fact sheet, is that um, the the final the the opening of the. Um, this um, second cast court was was actually December the 2018, so two years ago today. Um, uh, so actually when Jorge was with us, uh, we went into the program and we had a sort of um, period of two years in this cast court um, that you can see on the screen. Um, so thank you very much, Jorge, for inviting me. And um, thank you, Meredith, for, for doing all the necessary details and arranging it and getting me here on time. Um, and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share some of the experience and detail of a recent, of, of the project Jorge has been talking about. And, um, which has happened at the VNA to conserve the large architectural cast of Trajan's Column. 
Um, I've chosen the title engineered iteration to describe the VNA cast uh, in order to reference both the potentially repetitive process involved in molding and casting and the realization of the constructed and planned nature uh, of this object. I also looked, looked up um, potentially repetitive molding and con the uh, term iteration um, in a moment of doubt whether I'd got the right sort of sense of the word. And I really did enjoy one of these definitions that I'll share with you because I think it has some relevance to um, uh, the conservation work and particularly Trajan's column as a copy. Um, so the definition for iteration I'd like to share is um, it's the meaning of uh, the repetition of a mathematical or computational procedure applied to the result of a previous application as a means of obtaining success successively closer approximations to a solution or a problem. Um, and I, yeah, I just thought I'd share that with you because I think that that is something of um, both the experimental preservation that um, is often talked about um, in 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 that in that sphere. And um, yeah, I, 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 it made sense to me, um, and I hope hope it does over the talk to you. Um, so. Yeah, the project was um, unsurprisingly a, um, a, a completely collaborative project, and it was helped. Uh, uh, I was helped very much and supported by VNA colleagues, um, skilled freelance conservators, um, particularly Chloe Stewart and Leo Crowther, who were with me on the scaffold for. Um, the main part of the work and uh, key when I look back over all the documentation and the work that was done, um, you know, they really put a, a lot of thought, a lot of care and um, uh, time into the project. Um, and of course we had, uh, because it was a large building project refur refurbishment, we had a lot of, uh, we were working alongside a lot of external contractors who all, also were extremely helpful and skilled and um, uh, really important to the project. Um, and uh, just for, for uh, some sort of frame of this talk, I'm, I'm going to present it in three sections. Um, first, the context for the work. Second, the um, interrogate a little bit about the, the um, copy. Uh, and then third section, um, uh, the, the actual conservation work that uh, was able to take place and uh, which involved um, a small team of us uh, for those crucial six months where we had full scaffold access. So um, first slide. Um, so the historical context is, um, I'm not sure how well you all might know um, the Victoria and Albert Museum, but um, the Trajan's Column is, is, is in one of the um, historic galleries that um, houses the uh, cast collection, the plus cast collection of the museum. Um, and the V&A Museum involved, uh, evolved initially from, uh, I hope that's okay. I've got a sort of unstable connection. Um, the V&A Museum evolved from a school of design formed in 1837 under the direction of Henry Cole. The school of design moved to its current site in, the, in West London in 1857 and was renamed the South Kensington Museum, uh, which is later to be called the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, the museum rapidly expanded um, on the site at South Kensington uh, with build, huge building projects um, and a vastly quickly expanding uh, collection. And part of this rapid expansion was supported by the Great Exhibition in 1851, which was just up the road from uh, um, the museum. 
and the collection of plaster cast has had a vital role in that very quick acquisition and um, uh, direction of um, creating a, a collection very rapidly. Um, and um, so the, the, the plaster cast may, were, they did predate the uh, South Kensington Museum in the School of Design as uh, uh, educational reference pieces for the students. And they continued to have that sort of uh, significance and role and function. Um, but also the, the sort of ambition that happened um, for the museum under um, Henry Cole's uh, leadership was to rapidly increase the collection and and open it to a wider public, not just for art students, but for uh, the general population, uh, which, which at that time was quite contentious because he opened it up in the evenings um, and had free, free access. Um, so yeah, there was, uh, there was a lot of, and in fact, um, Jorge's friend, um, uh, John Ruskin, is it John Ruskin? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I came across the quote from him who, uh, you know, was was uh, absolutely horrified that uh, the museum was opening in the evenings um, and uh, also looking at early gas lighting to, to facilitate that. Um, so that is the historical context and um, uh, leaping into current day um, with the uh, Victoria and Albert Museum, the uh, over the last eight years, from 2012 to 2020, uh, there's been an enormous sort of uh, activity around the plaster cast collection and copying um, with new technologies and um, a lot of interest uh, globally uh, with with this uh, sort of. Um, possibilities I guess and um, so um, yeah the active the key things were uh, that happened in these eight uh, last eight years are um, the the convention uh, the town just flick back to that yeah so um, sorry I missed out one of the key points was the eight in 1867 um, what, what really uh, kind of accelerated the sort of exchange and acquisition of plaster casts was um, uh, what, what they called uh, a agreement that um, heads or princes of uh, f 15 uh, countries signed up to um, in 1867 and Henry Cole from the V&A was a key uh, and backed by Prince Albert was a key uh, promoter of this and it established a convention for the promoting universally productions, reproductions of works of art for the benefit of museums of all countries. So it really accelerated that whole uh, exchange across countries. And then, so this had a, um, an anniversary of 150 years um, in, 2017. Um, so there was a lot of sort of thoughts around, okay, um, that's significant. And, you know, sort of how would that be reinterpreted for today's um, reproduction and copying industry? So um, the, the VNA um, uh, had had a period of, of uh, invited uh, sort of forums, um, which was um, led very much by Brendan Cormier, one of the curators at the v &A, and and the publication that they, uh, at the end of this period of, um, in, it was published in 2018, which has got uh, a lot of the essays and the uh, writings around this new declaration, which is um, what the intention was. Um, and more on a more uh, mundane level, the um, the uh, refurbishment of the galleries carried on, and um, we moved across. Yeah, the 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 um, 
the project that uh, Jorge mentioned earlier was the, um, the one that's in the picture here. And uh, that, can, that had uh, smaller casts, sculptural casts, some that were built, one, one or two that were built into the wall and the structure of the gallery, but they were mainly small scale um, plaster casts, which we'd been involved in for two years before the opening in 2014. Um, another, another point was uh, the V&A was, in, 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 um, was invited to the Venice Architectural Biennale in, in 2015 and uh, that uh, also um, really kind of promoted uh, interrogating this sort of idea of copying in this digital Age and that was curated jointly by Brendan and um, another curator who Daniela Thorne, who who's um, moved on from the VNA. But um, yeah, so there's a publication also for that. It, that was called the exhibition was called um, Fragile Parts, I think. Fragile Parts. Um, so the, there was uh, a lot of curatorial interest, a lot of sort of bringing in. Uh, people from outside the museum and across across the globe, really, uh, who were really uh, involved in new technologies and um, interrogating sort of what this uh, copying meant uh, today. So, um, and then in the middle of that was Jorge's invitation to come and in and do an installation. So. Um, I don't know whether you, you've had a chance to uh, see this piece of work and there's a really great um, atmospheric film that was made by um, Alex that um, I'm sure Jorge could send the link to um, that, that really documents the uh, labour and the intensity of the, and ambition of the project. Um, it was... Uh, it was very intense because it was a sort of very clipped period of time and um, it, to my mind, it uh, introduced me to this uh, notion of experimental preservation, which was very exciting to have that. And the curator who was part of the ex larger exhibition that this was part of, Rory, um, Rory Hyde, he, I put his quote up there that I think, you know, is quite interesting for the piece um, that you can read at, at your leisure. Um, but basically he, you know, it really did shift a sort of, um, you know, a, a kind of significance and uh, um, interpretation of what these objects were, because I think they, they, they were still suffering a bit from uh, the people coming into the galleries and them being fairly deceptive. They, you know, are they real? Are they, what are they? What material are they? And um, I think that's been addressed with the new interpretation gallery that, that uh, when we finish this project, um, uh, that also opened, which is, um, you know, really broadening out and explaining and uh, illustrating what and how casts were made and copies are made right up to the present day uh, technologies. So, um, yeah, so the project here um, uh, was a great opportunity for me to uh, join the team. I did join it sort of after a lot of the negotiation, I think it happened and uh, Jorge and had decided on uh, the inside of one of the columns um, to do his installation, to construct it and then bring it out. So um, yeah, that part was done. And uh, as Jorge says, I was, I was sort of in a role of uh, the v &A conservator who <laughs> joined the project. And, uh, uh, so I did feel I needed to to put in a few, you know, formal um, uh, methodologies around, you know, sort of what might be expected of conservators, and um, which I, uh, I 
I feel Jorge had a, an eye on anyway, and uh, we ended up um, doing some paint analysis because we, the um, inside of the column was painted uh, top to bottom. Um, and uh, so we did some uh, paint analysis that was um, uh, undertaken by science um, in the conservation department. Um, and um, some good material trials on, on the inside, on the surfaces, various sort of strengths and various um, uh, latex products, as well as I remember Jorge also sort of doing trials with um, uh, matting to see what could possibly hold together uh, structurally for the um, for the uh, installation. So that was going on. And thirdly, uh, yes, so with these um, um, trials in, internally, um, we were able to sort of demonstrate uh, there was a little bit of a risk uh, with the paint surfaces um, and uh, was there an agreement of the head of sculpture at VNA, you know, to acknowledge there there's potential risk, uh, which he signed up to. He said, "Yes, great, go ahead." Um, and um, so, so it did go ahead, and it was a um, yeah, great, <laughs> great project. And um, the uh, one further thing I did as um, was involved in. Um, with um, uh, during the exhibition was condition checking and I thought um, my, my worry was that it would slump and it would tear and it would get heavier and move and um, so I was was sort of checking the uh, bottom uh, the days that I was at the museum and uh, and it did uh, within the first week or so it, it, it really did shift and then it sort of just settled and it didn't so so there was a sort of um yeah the, it, yeah it, it really endured and um it, it was a beautiful installation um so that was uh really great because that were really sort of brought to the front you know how we you know what are these objects and you know is that the inside of them um you know are they not solid? So um, moving on, we move straight into what happened as the, the second phase of um, the cast court, um, and which, which sit um, between the years um, 2016 to 2018. Um, and um, we were facing this, this sculpture Constellation Studio, which at the VNA, there was five of us at the time, um, you know, the, really recognised that we would be challenged by this project. Uh, one, because of the scale of the objects, there were 15 very large uh, architectural casts um, that were built into the fabric of the, um, the gallery. Um, and among among a further uh, huge number of, of uh, casts, uh, with lots, uh, yeah. So the scale was uh, looked to be an immediate issue, and the lack of any um, records of these objects, uh, which seemed to suggest no conservation work had been uh, undertaken on any of them, um, and the existing documentation system that we had at the VNA. Um, I think I'm right in saying the sculpture studio at that stage didn't have any um, way of digitizing, you know, we weren't producing digitized uh, condition reports or surveys. Um, we were working on acetate sheets with permanent pens and supported by photographs. So um, there was a lot of discussion and uh, looking into um, how would how would we tackle that element of the documentation the surveys and the records um, 
so uh, which moves us on to the next slide. So um, I just quickly, this section, I just want to um, give a little bit of precise um, the journey of uh, how the copy, the iteration that we have uh, came to us. Um, just to say, just, I did take the lead for the conservation of this project and was joined by Chloe and Leo's freelance conservators. So that was the team for this, although it's supported very much by studio members as well. Um, so the, 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 the treasure, Trajan's column is the marble um, column in Rome, uh, carved um, low relief hel hel helical frieze, um, and um, that was carved to commemorate uh, the two campaigns of Emperor Trajan uh, into Dacia, which uh, is current day Romania. Um, and that, uh, that's the original. And um, Napoleon III in 1861 um, commissioned molds to be taken and two copies to be made by a local uh, Italian cast, uh, casting workshop called Malpieri's in Rome. Um, and this was executed, um, this uh, picture on your left on the screen is the taken from um, the plus cast we have um, that um, you know sort of confirms that date uh, of that particular intervention of casting it and the great historic photo from that was given to us um, by Andrea Felici in, in Italy who, who runs a, a casting work shop and is still very committed to the, the um, industry um, and that shows you the scaffolding and the yeah the time of um, the, the mold um, so that's the, the so two two plast cast sets were made one stayed in Rome and one went to Paris and once they were in Paris, uh, Napoleon um, decided he would like it uh, electroplated um, to, so he could uh, e e exhibit it outside because uh, plast cast um, uh, is not an externally robust um, material. So he uh, gave the um, task to a guy, Leopold Audre, um, operating in Paris, who, and I quote, was a, a, an ingenious and enterprising industrialist. Um, he had been doing, known for smaller, smaller uh, electrotypes, and you can see here this, uh, that's the sort of scale, I think that's um, some uh, lampposts that he, was doing sort of urban furniture uh, on quite a, quite a large scale, but the the scale of Trajan's column was um, really uh, g going to challenge him. Um, however, he did uh, pull it off, and uh, he also um, brought out a couple of uh, patents that seemed to be associated possibly with uh, uh, that moment of him finding a way of. Um, casting the panels. Um, one of the patents around the time that he was um, electroplating the, um, the column was a uh, patent for a, um, an oil-based um, protective coat that could be applied to different materials. Um, so we're not quite, it's likely that the, um, in the process, the gutta percha um, uh, molds were taken from the plaster cast uh, the plaster positives and um, they, that, that would be the normal sort of way of process um, and these would be coated with a protective conductive layer um, and immersed in a galvanic bath in order to collect a thin regular layer of copper deposited by electrolysis 
uh, which is sort of what you're seeing in that etching. Um, so that, uh, that went, that happened with great success and uh, was completed in 1865 in Paris. Um, no, sorry, it was, it was completed uh, 1862, three. 1865 is the date when uh, all the copper, the electrotypes, the, the electroplates of the column were um, put on six wooden drums like the one you see here uh, on, on display. Uh, still at the National Archaeological uh, Museum in uh, Saint-Germain-en-Laye. Um, so 1865 was when they all went on, on display at the Louvre. But somewhere before that, the v uh, had expressed an interest in um, 70 of the, uh, the panels. So um, the understanding is that the electrotype the electrotype panels went to a further workshop run by Abel Matra, uh, who was a well-known um, sculptor, sculptor uh, from the Louvre and was very much involved in the um, Museum of National Antiquities that uh, Napoleon had set up in 1862. Uh, which took moulds from archaeological dig digs and different European museums. So he was well versed with casting and moulding. And he took the electrotypes and um, made moulds mold, and uh, cast the plaster positives for a set of 70 panels, which were sent to the V&A in 1864. So, um, that, so that's when we received the first section of um, our cast, and that was displayed in, um, in the North Court, which was a gallery that predated the uh, cast courts. Um, and yeah, so the, 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 the complete set were quickly followed um, and they arrived uh, at the V&A in 1871 and were installed um, in the gallery, in the new gallery, which is what we're terming the cast court now, is in 1874. And we know that because there is a very prominent, um, there's, there's the, um, yeah, so I should have shifted quickly to this one because that explains it really rather than. Um, so there we see the brick chimneys that were built to support the uh, panels. Um, and we see the what was moved out was uh, deinstalled from the other gallery, the first 70 panels um, that were the first to arrive in, in the v &A, and that that they, they've been fixed already to to the uh, one of the um, brick chimneys. Um, just to say quickly, so the, the structure of, of the um, support um, are two brick chimneys and we're just gonna, we call yeah, this column one and the one behind it column two. So the column one is the base and it's got the square pedestal at the bottom. Um, and then that rises up cuts off at 20 meters and then the second section that in reality would sit on top uh, is a, a further 15 meters. Um, so the, the installation seemed to happen over a period of eight, uh, three or four years um, and it was a group of uh, these royal engineers who have inscribed their names on here. Um, yeah. Uh, so two brick chimneys and the methods of, of fixing that we found out was um, different for both, that um, they seem to bed the panels directly onto the brick columns for this first uh, column that you see in the historic photo. And then on the second, um, it seems like they were dry fitted onto timber work that was on the outside, put on the outside of the, um, the brickwork. 
Um, so that's as we progressed with the project that that also was um, just one of the sort of inconsistencies and the differences between the different parts of the uh, of, of the uh, column actually. So um, just to say quickly what else um, yeah methods of fixing were different um, on on the um, this column uh, in in the historic photo they'd be bedded onto the brick and then had uh, masonry nails um, just holding them uh, from slipping uh, keying them in and um, in and on the other column there was um, more screws going through the front into the um, the timbers and the dry space um, between the back of the panel and the column, the uh, brickwork. Um, so there's over 500 plaster sections and uh, mostly numbered, uh, and which is quite interesting, I think, for people to see and read. Um, so moving on from there, we had the uh, gallery filled with uh, scaffold um, and 10 levels in all to reach the, uh, the, the scaffold uh, was purposed for the, the refurbishment to reglaze the, um, reglaze the ceiling, do redecoration re of the polychromy and the paint scheme in the gallery. Um, and uh, we fitted into that sort of schedule really. So um, the conservation priorities. Um, so it, in the lead up to it, it was it was sort of it, it was significant that it was a building project because um, uh, conservation didn't have the initiative, couldn't initiate um, those larger sort of decisions around schedules and um, resourcing to some degree. Um, so we, we were in a sort of reactive position and um, um, the priorities therefore, um, we had six, six months to with complete access and then we would lose that. So the, the priorities um, that um, seem to you know, really come up as is important where the to be able to record materials and condition inside and out uh, because we the, nothing existed for it. Uh, we wanted to trial and investigate the materials on the columns, and um, we also wanted to trial, you know, our materials for interventions, and we wanted to undertake remedial conservation work and um, I suppose largely um, I saw it as, as a phase of work that uh, would hopefully be followed by other phases of uh, conservation work. So um, and this uh, picture on the right is is the sort of breakdown of um, <clears throat> you know where the platforms the um, lifts of the scaffold uh, intersect it and what we were <coughs> what we were working from um, so so we had um, a team of um, rope axis um, conservators from Sunny Strachey Historic Conservation um, who arrived for one day in March and um, for an inspection of the and um, assessment of the condition. And then they came back in June for a week to do um, vacuum clean of the insides of both and localized stabilization and more to work. But the essentially the, the uh, structure was in good shape. Um, it was a great opportunity. We got some great um, uh, details photographs which may possibly have been taken by uh, Chloe or Leo and or Leo 
because uh, they were escorted down on ropes as well as part of the um, June uh, work, which was great. Um, and uh, yeah, so we've got uh, some uh, great detail um, here of the um, column two, where you get, so we're looking from the inside to the back of the panel, which is scored, and then you get this timber um, in between the back of the panel and the, the brick. Um, sometimes the gap between the back of the panel and the brick was up to 17 centimeters. So it's sort of fairly various and it obviously uh, helped in some ways to give a, a sort of scope and uh, some tolerance in, in when they were fitting the panels. Um, the, the heavily bricked one, the aperture below it, is the um, looking at the back of a cast uh, through from the inside of the uh, column one to the outside. Um, so yes, very efficient and uh, made a lot of sense the rope access because they they uh, the the two cast courts have got a great uh, Victorian iron structure above uh, that could be tied, you know, ropes could be tied off, but I think they possibly might have used the scaffold as well to tie off their ropes, but uh, there's a lot of potential there really for that. Um, and so some stability. So the, the other thing that we were aware of because of this sort of big uh, activity around new technologies of, of copying was, um, uh, and the um, function of the column in a way, there was a great interest in, in this narrative and the carving and the, the detail on it. And um, so uh, one of the things we were able to do was a, a quick pilot study, um, partly because there's a very uh, skilled photographer in uh, at the VNA called George X, who uh, is an art, has an art practice and works the word and image department and he was really interested in in getting as much, many photo so he he used the photogrammetry technique and then we were um supported by karina from uh, university of brighton who bought a scan a scanner up from the university and um worked through doing some uh, scanning um and this um <coughs> this uh, section here is is uh, George's on the right on your sort of right the the, the darker one um, is George's 3d model of the section that we were able to do um, and I, I suppose it was just taking advantage of this um, access and it was also um, a good key to finding out what the challenges might be um in in capturing the data and estimating you know the data for storage um so hopefully that will be helpful to have on record and you know if ever there was a opportunity to for that to happen um and then the other just keep in mind the other the other thing um that i felt was really important was uh how are we going to you know for for conservation, how are we going to sort of um, photograph and keep uh, good, consistent photographs? So we were able, we were supported in, in having a, a short contract for a good photographer, Carlos, who came and he, he took very systematic, good photos um, after conservation. And um, he, so what, so what we have is a consistent set of raw images and then on each level of the uh, the scaffold, he he stitched the the image on the left. You can see is he stitched um, these photos together. And so for one level, we'll have a series of four connecting photographs. And and the the plan is to to make a, a sort of numbered grid that we can um, have for conservation check records um future work but also to have that publicly accessible for people who are interested i mean they're a great resolution of photographs and um 
you know, while we were working, we would never have been able to achieve that without that, um, without Carlos uh, providing that. So we're very lucky to have those. Um, so uh, where are we going? Yes, and our external survey. So we did try and digitize and we ended up uh, all trying uh, working with Photoshop and um, the, yeah, so, um, so we stitched images that we were taken in the gallery before the scaffold happened and we were able to sort of use those. We got um, up to 20 different uh, uh, criteria that we were recording. Uh, we were trying to record both material and um, uh, deterioration issues um, and treatment. We, so we used these also to overlay treatments. So you, with those little um, numbers you can see on the right are uh, uh, sites where we've uh, done stabilization or corrosion treatments on, on metal bars. Um, so quite a lot of information and I think it works reasonably well. Um, so our deterioration patterns that came to light were soiling, cracking, metal corrosion, um, instability, plaster of metal, low, um, water damage, um, salt activity, polychromy, um, sort of layering of uh, paint layers and weathering of them, um, some alteration of them, discoloration. So quite a, a lot going on. Um, and then we, for our remedial treatments, we, uh, we obviously had to be fa fairly clear about the fact that we only had the resources and the time to do remedial treatments. And um, so we, but we had a set, quite a full set of um, uh, activities to do. And, um, they're listed there. Um, so just uh, digging a little bit deeper, we've got some magnificent work of Chloe's. Um, um, these are um, one of the issues sort of uh, um, and to does it clean with uh, or alternatives can we use and materials can we use without uh, the, uh, the paint layers uh, just, um, you know although we, we you know our understanding was growing sort of as we went, um, we decided on um, uh, a dry cleaning, uh, vacuuming and using wishabs and smoke sponges. Uh, so in that way, we could have some control, some sort of uh, consistency between the two uh, columns that were seemed to be quite different in the materials they had and their construction and um, uh, yeah so the cleaning was decided to be a dry clean uh, it's an example of the different paint layers <coughs> that uh, in places we couldn't really understand why they were there uh, but suspected they may you know, was there a loss of paint there or were they a sort of consolidating uh, or an artistic um, intervention? Um, we sort of held the question for many months. And I'm still <laughs> not sure. Uh, and this is very interesting. We were, we more and more, we uh, were aware of this sort of spotting uh, throughout both columns actually, but much more um, evident on the column one towards the base and uh, we did have 
that analysed and they were seem to be uh, spots of copper, which seems seems to relate really to the uh, fact that the the moulds for our casts were were taken from the electroplates, the copper plates in Paris. So. Um, so that's what we're going with at the moment, but uh, who knows? <laughs> um, then we also had some possibilities, uh, limited possibilities actually for um, laboratory analysis. Um, uh, we have some, we had um, not for want of um, trying or wanting to be available, it's just the um, Teams the in, in science were very under pressure, and um, however, we we got uh, cross sections done, some FTIR, and um, so we got some began to get some information about what materials were in these layers, um, and we also had the opportunity to do send uh, some samples. A few samples to a lab in Erfurt in Germany uh, because they had slightly different um, possibilities uh, to look at uh, or, uh, organic um, materials. Um, so it, it was what still is sort of unclear really is because of the size of uh, the, the, the cast, um, you take tiny samples and it's hard to see them as fully representative of the whole thing. So uh, what we did get from Erfurt um, is the idea that there was definitely oil uh, and wax and the white paint there. And um, there is this term of lithopon, which was a very popular uh, paint used uh, late 1800s. Um, so quite a lot of materials to look at and um, it really uh, is about, okay, so how are those materials now, how are, are they characterized and how will, are they behaving in relationship to the location and the other elements that are going on, the environmental in element conditions in the gallery and um, various treatments and interventions. Also, uh, we had no compositional, um, work done on the plaster um, so we don't know what was yeah what traces there were in the actual plaster either so that's an indication of the sort of levels of soiling um, and um, we were aware that some areas were heavily soiled and there was a sort of cementation um, which can build up um, particularly um, with fibres um, on horizontal levels. Um, <clears throat> also, if you've got salts and sugars um, in the materials around them, they do apparently bind a lot deeper. And unfortunately, un where, where you're getting heavy soiling, we were also aware that um, there was some weathering and uh, absence of polychromy. So, um, yeah, the... the um, so if, yeah, I mean, it's sort of, clear, it, well, it was important to sort of, uh, I feel that um, the levels of the cleaning, we didn't uh, do a, a hugely interventive clean and um, possibly um, the layers of dirt may, you know, that we didn't remove. Uh, if we had removed them, we would have exposed the weathered uh, more vulnerable surface. So um, that's uh, it. Um, and we get cracking, I'm overrunning, sorry, Jorge. A uh, bit of crack, well, lots of cracking. The pattern uh, for the cracking was essentially there was uh, cracking along the edges of the panels, sort of vertical and horizontally um, throughout both columns. And um, uh, fortunately, the rope axis was able to sort of see that there was really good stability in the brickwork so it, it those cracks weren't didn't seem to relate to the internal structure and um, it seems 
possibly they are shrinkage cracks from uh, the joints, the um, material in the joints, which was sort of uh, more vulnerable than the solid panels. And then we get the embedded uh, iron, uh, corrosion of the embedded iron. All the panels were had um, square bar strips sort of almost framing them, but embedded. Uh, in the plaster. Some were very close to the edges of the panels. Uh, some were very close to the front surface. And these were cracking, a series of cracking and uh, pushing away and um, loss. There we are. There's a picture of loss of uh, what that corrosion has done. And there's some uh, work in progress in the middle one with Chloe's um, uh, handiwork about to happen. So we, we were stabilizing, grouting, and treating the visible corrosion. Um, and there's the future. So we need to continue with further um, material characterization, uh, particularly for the corrosion soiling. And yeah, and we, we have done a little bit of uh, acoustic emissions uh, uh, yeah, um, with a, a colleague who, who uh, we, we did uh, gather data for a week, uh, looking at the cracking, you know, sort of whether it was responding to RH, but we're still looking at that data and watch the space. And um, yeah, I think it's all there. And uh, I'm sorry, I've sort of overgone. So thank you very much for listening. And uh, here we are. Thank you, Sarah. Wonderful presentation. Really appreciate the, the 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 level of detail at which you took us, and also the broad oh, frame um, that you presented to us to understand this um, the, the the context for the conservation work that happened. So we have a, some time for Q and A, and since we yeah. are um, an intimate group, I'm going to encourage anybody that wants to ask a question or anybody indeed that wants to just turn on their camera to, to ask a question rather than go through the cumbersome process of me having to read your questions off of uh, the chat. Uh, you can just, you know, raise your hand and, um, uh, you know, there's the, or you can just turn on your, your computer. Um, so as you all think about your questions uh, for Sarah, um, uh, I, of course, was just fascinated by this whole process, Sarah, and I'll just get started with some with some thoughts that maybe you can expand upon a little bit. And that has to do with the difference that you pointed to between the two sections of the columns. Um, so you made a case that these were two different casting campaigns, if I understood correctly, that they came to the museum at different times, the two sections of the column. Um, I understand that correctly? Well, um, it's um, all, all I've got so far is a bit of uh, archival sort of work about the sort of timings of them. But certainly we received the uh, lower section, which was 70 panels. We received that um, at least four years uh, before the rest. And uh, they were on display in one of the other galleries. So we believe they were under different conditions. Um, they, they were cast by the same workshop. So it's likely that they were possibly, you know, had the same treatment and uh, were made in the same way. But they did have at least um, almost 10 years, just under 10 years in a different location in, in the museum. And um, there was great improvements and interest uh, in the building of the cast courts to look at ventilation and heating and, um, you know, that possibly wasn't there with the other cast. So, yeah, there was certainly a difference with that section from the rest of the shaft. Um, and then from the uh, one section to the other, uh, there was definitely, I think in terms of I mean, the rest of the column, the panels arrived um, together and they're likely to have been from the same workshop. Because one of the so, really interesting things that you raise is that, okay, this is supposed to read as one column, even though it's split down the middle. 
And of course, if in the yes. process of conservation, you change the color of one and one is lighter yes. than the other or darker than the other, then they're not gonna read as one column. So you, you were facing this fundamental problem of making these two separate physical pieces kind of integrate within the context of, of the visual experience of the visitor. Uh, and that to me is very interesting, that kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, aesthetic anticipation mm. of the work. And, and um, so I was, uh, I wanted you to reflect on that a little bit more because it seems to me that um, you did very little to the, to the actual sculpt, uh, to the actual cast, right? You, 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 you did some remedial work, you call it. Um, but um, and and you mentioned well we were constrained by time you know we weren't in charge of the the, the scaffolding we had to get it done yes. quick and so on and so yeah. forth limited means you know this is a typical project in other words for for architects yeah. uh, and, and architectural projects is always about you know how long can you afford that scaffolding up and how much money do you have and so on. there's no luxury to bring the painting into the into the lab and have it sit there yeah. for. For years, you're you're on a, you're on a time schedule, but let's imagine for a moment a kind of counterfactual history where you had all the money in the world and all the time in the world um, to work on these columns. I'm going to call them columns because there's two, although we're yeah. mentally supposed yeah. to put them together. Yeah. Would you think about what you would do on them differently in terms of their color, and did you see? You know, would you, for example, clean them both um, and see what what and then take a step back and see what they look like and then apply something to them? Would you consider an application of some sort to them to even out the color? I mean, I know in, uh, you had done a bunch of research on the use of original patination and kind of coloration techniques on the plaster and linseed oil was applied to them and different kinds of things. So would you consider that application of a surface to the to the column um, in a conservation campaign, or would you, again, in a in a, in a complete um, you know ideal world, would you would you feel that it would be more appropriate to only stabilize and remove or clean what is damaged? Uh, so with all the time in the world, I think there would there would be an order of priorities. One would be the corrosion uh, and the ones that were sort of actively uh, working on the column and the form and the surface, you know, because they, they have a risk, you know, and the corrosion was one of those, you know, serious risks. And um, I think uh, things like the cracking, um, I think we would probably prioritize um, work on that to close up, um, you know, ingress of dust and uh, moisture, possibly. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there would be sliding uh, sort of scale and uh, certainly there would be some really serious uh, characterization of materials, because I think, I, I suppose what 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 may be a little bit deceptive in those um, images that I showed is, is that, um, I mean, when you're standing in the gallery, I don't think the aesthetic uh, difference is, is visible in some ways. But when you're up close, um, like we were trying to understand, okay, what materials have we got on, on the surfaces? Um, you know, you start to see the multiple layers and um, the differences, you know, of, of behavior of, of the uh, material. So I think for the uh, spectator, the aesthetic, um, and it might have been a little bit deceptive in those photographs. The aesthetic wasn't, didn't, you know, isn't, isn't vis visibly apparent, I don't think, but, um, I, I mean, I've never really taken uh, aesthetic very um, as the uh, important <laughs> issue, <laughs> but that, but you know, it absolutely is there. But uh, it's it's um, 
it, it's not one I, I um, give much time to actually. Tell me more about that. Why, why is it that for you the aesthetics is not um, at the core? I don't know, actually. <laughs> I don't know. I, I suppose it's, uh, yeah. I mean, for Trajan's column, the, um, um, you know, the c complexity of what we saw as quite active um, deterioration was the, uh, what held our attention mostly really. Um, but the, the interesting thing is, I mean, there, can, uh, the, the, there, is a diff there was a difference between the two sections, but within, within the columns, there was also, you know, vast sort of inconsistencies. And um, um, it was quite interesting to, in conversation with one of the uh, decorators who was there um, for the refurbishment, and he said, oh yeah, no, that's, um, that's a scumble. That's a scumble. It's a, it's a term for um, how um, decorators mix oil and, and wax and pigment and to give um, a, an appearance of stone. So you get you don't get these contiguous uh, paint layers, but you get a sort of uh, mixed effect, a painted effect. So I don't know. That's uh, also a question. Scumble, and, scumble. That's the that, term. Scumble. And would that effect have been put on after the pieces were assembled together? In other words, that would have been the kind of final finishing yeah. touch at the V&A, yeah. or yeah, were yes. or were they treated prior to arrival? Um, I think it would be one of uh, once they were installed because it was a sort of contiguous over the gap fill and the joints and the, and um, uh, what was I going to say? Yes, and on we did get we did find signatures that very definitely uh, indicated that there was um, uh, interventions, serious interventions. Um, uh, there was a cleaning phase in uh, the 1920s, I think, throughout the gallery. 1920s, 1929, there was a signature on the column. Um, and again in the uh, 1950s. I mean, it, it's sort of, there, there were phases of redecoration in the gallery, and it's probably not a surprise that they uh, would have had some impact on the, on the uh, columns. That's, that's but uh, I did notice I've got one of uh, the uh, great conservators in the chat room. We could, uh, we could ask her about the uh, what she thinks to the um, uh, <laughs> paint layers. By all means. She's called, she's called Chloe. Chloe, are you, are you there? Are you still with us? I am. I'm still here, yes. Ah, and I showed all your lovely photos of the solubility tests. And uh, did you hear Jorge's uh, question about the aesthetic and difference between the two columns and the paint layers? And I did. I mean, in terms of when we were working on, on the columns, in terms of the sort of solubility tests, they were, um, we kind of established a broad pattern in terms of spectrum solubility and, and on column one with the base, um, the 20 meter column, the polychromy or, or the coatings and the layers were predominantly water soluble. And then on column two, they were, it, it was far more complex. They seemed to be soluble in almost all the solvents we trialed actually. And I think it was, is it column two, Sarah, that you were thinking of that um, was more of a scumble approach in terms of the decorative schema and, and the way the paint has been applied? Um, no, it was the other one. <laughs> it was the sort of um, the greys and the the ochres that I felt were more apparent on the uh, column one. That right. sort of uh, I I wondered whether they might fit into that. Do, do, I mean, do you? Chloe, do you have a, a strong aesthetic uh, sense of what you would have done 
if we'd had limitless time and would that have been a priority for you? Um, not from an aesthetic point of view. I mean, I think it was really important, although the cleaning was subtle and, and of course we were working within, you know, a number of constraints. Um, it did make a significant difference. And I think there was a priority on trying to um, make sure that the panels could be read clearly and with such a large object, um, yes. bending over Good such a great height point, yeah. and not necessarily fantastic yeah. lighting, although there was a lot of attention paid to lighting with this second phase. I think that um, it's easy to get lost when you're working up close on such a big object, but I think the cleaning did make a significant difference, although it was, it was, it was just dry cleaning. So from that sense, aesthetically, I mean, that was a priority for me, making sure that the object could really be read and that the detail could be brought out. And um, yeah. that was a priority. I mean, I think, uh, you know, in terms of applying coating or protective layer, in a sense that would have been not appropriate perhaps in this instance. Um, because partly because the objects are just so complex in terms of their their layer and their history, and also perhaps on, in terms of a level of the scale of intervention that that would have um, entailed applying a coating, I think, um, and also perhaps that it was isn't wasn't necessary, um, although the objects had sort of been significantly damaged over the years through various leaks from the roof from the enormous glass roof um so there were wow. consistent patterns as we were doing our condition survey of, of areas of damage down the east side of the column and the west side of the column um where water had run down the plaster cast and and where you know huge amounts of diesel had been lost um and, and that was i mean that was the fantastic thing about the project wasn't it really sarah but having that length of time to be up close on a scaffold i think it's the first time it had been scaffolded out in that way since yes. the columns were installed yes. back in 1854 yes. so it allowed a unique opportunity to establish patterns on you know micro and macro scale so i i have one more question and then i there's one question from uh, uh norman uh that i'm going to turn the microphone over to him but uh, sarah would you mind going back to that one slide of the date that uh, that says 1861 rome um uh that's on the column yes i'm trying now let's what's happened how do i go back to that um I'm yeah. not sure what's all right, but maybe am I new our screen sharing? Uh um yeah, I'm trying to go I'm just gonna get some technical support. Don't worry about it if if it's uh, if it's too hard, but it's a basically in, a, my, in a uh, circle, right? It, it's it's inside of a circle. Yes, no, I know it, yes. And, so how do I get back to Washington? And is it um, is it the case that that was an infill from a? Um, I mean, it, the, the the column has these, yeah. these kind of circular yes. damages that seem to me to be like uh, cannonball strikes. Well, you know, um, there was some great. Thanks, Roger. Which, Which way are we going up? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's a um, right yes, right there. well, yes. so um, there is some uh, thing that I read that these were actually, um, they were actually um, original to the marble construction yeah. and they were somehow uh, pegs. They were pegs of uh, possibly lead that uh, joined the marble uh, drums because ah. the the whole column, the original. Yeah, the does that make sense? I don't know. Does I mean, whole, I'm, I'm just going to see if. So, for example, on here, can you see my cursor? You've got one here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and uh, they're not they're not regular. I mean, the wind the the apertures go regularly up straight, but these appear um, fairly irregularly. But and um, but yeah, I did I didn't I haven't followed it up, but I think I did read that they were 
plugs because the the original had a series of 19 solid marble uh, drums and mm. uh, they carved the spi spiral, spiral steps inside and then they carved the, um, the relief and then they went on top of each other and I think these were somehow um, uh, plugs to stop them uh, shifting. Does okay, well, what, what interests me actually, about uh, is, not, is maybe not so much what what was there before, but the fact that the fact that there yeah. was something missing was the place where previous, I'm going to call them conservators that made right. the copies, um, introduced their a, a, yes. a, 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 a bit of information, a date, a place, sometimes a name, you know, where the hand yeah. of the conservator shows more obviously than 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 less and certainly in the work of conservation one is always um or, or for the most part um trying to not show one's hand but to let the right. show itself and i'm curious about these moments when the conservators decide to take that take that step into asserting their presence and their hand in the history of the object. And you mentioned it several times that there were all these dates that were introduced. Yeah. Go up, you can see them. And so did you sign the column? Did you put a date? Did you introduce a uh, uh, your own register within this campaign, these, these kind of several campaigns? Did you leave a visit? On, on the actual object. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, we found um, we found a lot of uh, time capsules in a lot of the large objects that um, are a way that um, some people who are working on them do leave some quite interesting uh, time capsules of uh, various things. Um, we did get um, signatures, um, I suppose. Um, yeah, no, no, I I haven't done that, and I I I sort of feel, um, you know, we've got all these um, sort of um, parallel parallel worlds because we've sort of formed this this whole, um, you know, other um, documentation and other sort of object through documentation. I suppose that's that's our. Do you know what I mean? We've we've you know created these these uh, kind of yeah parallel documents that uh, are the object now but as well um I see so that's where so, you i mean it, yeah it's also interesting on there that we're getting the uh, that's the panel number above it the 216 so <clears throat> uh you know that relates to the next uh, casting because that i couldn't see those on the electroplates so they must belong to our uh, set of casts yeah that's that's fascinating so, the, 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 yeah there's a sort of layering the of it accumulates all these levels of information yes. within it yes um i'm going to turn it over yeah. to norman who had a question Yes, just a just a quick question. If you could comment a little bit more on the composition of the plaster itself, um, was it a pure gypsum plaster? Was there any filler at all in it? Were there fiber reinforcements that you hadn't commented on so far, or other things that you found? Well, um, hello, Norman. Uh, are you? Are you yeah. Um, so, yeah, we had no. Um, opportunity to do any compositional work on the plaster. Um, I, I think that w would be great in, uh, in the next phase. Um, and so there was nothing visible um, added to the plaster in terms of fiber. Um, and um, I guess what we, uh, the reinforcement that we did see very visibly was the uh, iron bar uh, that was embedded in, in the plaster panels, you know, to structurally support them. Um, uh, what else? Um, 
Yeah, we're, we're not sure whether there was uh, additives in the plaster. Yeah, do you, do you have uh, an interest in gypsum? Some experience in of gypsum? In plasters in general, if you have some samples that you can spare, you might send one over to us. <laughs> Great. Maybe we can, uh, ah. can help you on this. Are you, are you a colleague of uh, Jorge's? I am. I am indeed. Oh, great. Okay. And of many yes. people, that, and of many that you work with in London, um, Jennifer Dinsmore, for example, Vanessa yes. Simeone, um, yes. at the Abbey. I've worked with uh, the Sally Strachey team at the Tower. Oh. So, wow. Yes. Unfortunately, not flying anywhere these days, but I usually, I usually Cross. come over many times a year. Fantastic. Well, yes, when you can do. You know, make sure you come to us at the uh, VNA. Of course, of course. And if you, find uh, I, uh, little, if you find a piece of plaster, send it along to Jorge. Thank you. But I mean, all we we I do know that it's a really complex uh, material, and and you know, even colleagues who've worked in uh, wall painting uh, conservation, you know, feel it's a really under-published sort of aspect to uh, conservation. Anyone who's, you know, kind of got the courage to really uh, look at gypsum. Yeah. Do you so, feel that? Is that your understanding yeah, as well? I agree. Or? I agree. And by the time this was done in the middle of the 19th century, there were a lot of tricks to working yes. with gypsum plasters. It wasn't just yeah. the ordinary stuff. And, and in addition to accelerators and retarders, they were hardeners and surface treatments that we are just beginning to understand now. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have, there's a question from James. James, go ahead. Okay, I can unmute myself. Hello. Nice to meet you, Sarah. Hello. Uh, I'm another fellow Brit, so it's great to, to see the work that the VNA is doing over there before lockdown last uh, summer. So, uh, you know, it's a great institution. Uh, thank you for all your work. Um, okay. So I had a quick question about, you talked about the corrosion and I'm assuming you're talking about the iron bar, which you just mentioned, uh, whether you're talking about rusting or were you talking about other corrosion? And what are your plans to stabilize it? Um, that's gonna be probably a difficult decision and I was wondering you know were you considering you know more advanced processes maybe like lasers or were you thinking simply chemical kind of decisions or what 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 were you uh, thinking about that yeah no no a really significant question I'll just go back to those oh no I'm going the wrong way um yeah so the those are the uh, embedded iron bars in each panel um and the uh, treatment we did, so there's one up to the right. Um, and so what, what we, treatment we did do was, um, we used, we did a very sort of light touch really of what was visible um, and uh, used tannic acid to um, stabilize the, the uh, convert the um, the corrosion and then we put a layer of um, uh, paroid B44 over as a protective layer. Yeah, I saw the tannic acid. I was wondering if that was uh, relevant. Yes, that's all we, uh, that's all we, we did this time round and we uh, stabilized around it. We didn't, um, uh, fill and cover them. Um, <clears throat> partly, uh, I guess the decision was that, that I felt throughout the project we ha only had a partial understanding. So, uh, you know, it, it wasn't necessarily, our decisions weren't necessarily all about, you know, or not having enough time. They were also about <clears throat> only having a partial understanding for a lot of these materials. So, um, <laughs> But I think uh, at the end of the project, um, you know, that would have been something I probably, uh, you know, I do regret that we didn't <laughs> cover them because it seems to relate, yeah, 
it, it seems that uh, you know where where it's spalling and cracking and uh, pushing the plaster off, you know, they're, they're sort of within uh, a millimeter to four millimeters cover over that corrosion. So it's, it's, it would be helped as a support, I think, not only the uh, kind of protective layer of resin and leaving them as that, but having also a sort of material physical cover to them. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, so in terms of sort of long term treatment, I mean, one of the things we were interested in looking at is is using acoustic emissions to monitoring to find out what, you know, what is happening and how active is the cracking. Um, and I understand that acoustic emission monitoring, you can really kind of, uh, you're aware of it before you can see it. You know, it's a very sensitive. The, the Getty brought out quite a nice um, um, publication. Or they've been doing a lot of work on it, so I think that would be a good way to go. I don't know. Do you have any uh, experience of treatments for co corrosion? That yeah, I mean, I've just so I've just um, so I'm part of the program. Uh, I graduated this year, and I'm working for a a metalwork conservator in just north of oh, Philadelphia you? right now. But I'm. I'm, uh, talk, I talk a lot to David Watkinson at, at Cardiff, who you probably know, and the, um, I'm not sure if you're aware of him, but he's the expert in corrosion on ironwork in the UK. Um, so I've been discussing a few things with him, and they've done a lot of work on corrosion and iron. So, and no, is he uh, attached? I, Sorry. He's is not he attached, attached to Columbia, um, but to, um, to I just... institution or...? Yeah, Cardiff University. Oh, okay, thanks. Yeah. So they do a lot of the corrosion work uh, out of the UK uh, for the universities. Um, but no, I was just curious because there's a lot of talk about corrosion inhibitors and there's so many different options uh, and it must be so difficult to choose which one. But uh, definitely I would say that, um, testing for audio or testing the audio, I should say, uh, sounds very interesting way of at least, you know, much like, you know, testing for cracks sounds uh, like a good way to go yeah and i think i think you can see in these photos there there was some residue of uh, coatings uh on on them and there was there there was some sampling and uh, it seemed to be a, a zinc coating that was applied at some stage to the right. iron um and Having said that, actually, I have uh, we, I did get in touch with uh, somebody called David Farrell, who uh, is very keen on the um, cathodic um, treatment for corrosion. You know where you you yeah, uh, cathodic, wire, yeah. yeah. So, uh, but um, kind of not really appropriate for this because they don't, as far as we can see, the, the bars don't link up. But I mean, I, I'm not sure how that would look. That might be an aesthetic uh, issue there, Jorge, if we wired it all up. I would say it probably would. Well, Sarah, thank you. I, I just want to... Thank you, James. Uh, yes, thank you so much for, for your great lecture. Thank you for bringing us into this amazing uh, project, which is only the tip of the iceberg, of course, in, in your practice and to share your knowledge with us today. So, so really um, deep gratitude from all of us for, for, for participating in the lecture series and bringing your expertise and sharing it with us. So thank you so much. Thanks. Okay.